Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus gave this amazing sermon, one of the first big sermons he gave, and certainly one that was, uh, they really felt it needed to be captured. They, they wrote it out, got it verbatim. And I've been teaching from uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3 down to 10, all the blessedness, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, those who are merciful those who are pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted. And I've never taught this before. I just really felt something the Lord put together for me for, for this, uh, this season that we're in. And so the last couple Sundays, if you want to go back, you can listen to those. They're, they're different than anything I've ever heard before. And uh, I think what Jesus did is he, he taught this in a way that it would stick, in a way that was memorable. He's talking about spiritually advantageous it is for those to go through these different things. And then the rest of chapter 5, 6, and 7, if you notice it's all in red, it's all Jesus' sermon, it's an amplification of that first half dozen verses that, that he put together from 3 to 10. And it's, it develops it, it amplifies it. And so it's really worth studying. What I'd like us to do this morning is go to the end of chapter 5. We're just going to take a few minutes with this, but let's go to the end of chapter 5, verse 48. Uh, let me, let me um, begin this by saying, are you mature? Are you a mature Christian? Are you a mature Christian? By your own estimation, would you consider yourself a mature Christian? We often think of maturity as uh, having to do with tenure. If you're, if, you're, if you're with something a long time, a club, uh, or you're the elder in the family, you've, you've lived longer than anybody else, so you're mature. And I don't think that's the measure of maturity. I've seen some 17-year-olds that are far more mature than pastors who've been pastoring for 30 years in terms of their behavior, in terms of how they walk, how they relate. In verse 48, Jesus says, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the word perfect here, it's a big word. It's got lots of implications to it. But one slice of this word is the word mature, maturity. So everything that Jesus is teaching is to bring us to a place that we're like our father. We're children who grow up and begin acting and responding and living out our lives like our dad, like our, our heavenly father. That's the goal. That's the sum total of everything. That's why you're going through what you're going through. Maybe that's why we're going through what we're going through as a nation. Different things we've read in the scripture says that we go through trials to bring about maturity. He's saying here that the goal is to be perfect, and it's not perfect in the sense of uh, immaculate, uh, you know, uh, perfect in the sense that you don't do anything wrong or you, 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 you never miss it. It's not that kind of perfection. It has to do with maturity. So... What I challenge you to do is take verse 48 and read this sermon backwards. Verse 48 is the bottom line. And so how you treat each other, for example, if you treat someone, um, treat someone who's treating you badly and you, you dish it out and you treat them just as badly right back, you communicate just as negatively as they've negatively communicated to you and you give them a dose of their own medicine, you're not mature. He said, even tax collectors, I mean, that's like, <clears throat> in that day, like that was the, the worst kind of uh, 
person in society. And he says, you, you, you've grown to the level of spirituality of a tax collector. Even tax collectors can do that. It takes no grace for you to dish it back out to those who've dished it to you. It takes no grace to do that. To break with that tendency, that desire to do that, they give you the cold shoulder, you give them the cold shoulder right back. He said, tax, that's tax collector kind of love. That's the level. They, do, they can do that. One time the Lord called me on my love level. He said, you're not, your love level is too low. And at first my response is, I'm a nice guy. I, 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 I have friends. People like me. How could you say my, my love level is too low? But he got me. I knew he was right, but I just didn't know how he could say that because I, I saw myself as a nice person. But all of a sudden, he started shedding light on how I responded to people when they treated me badly. And I saw my love level was no different than an unbeliever. Here I was, a pastor at the time. I couldn't deny it. It's true. How you respond to persecution, how you, whether you pray for those who despitefully use you in verse 44, whether you curse those who curse you or you bless them. And one guy, he said, yeah, the Lord was saying, bless, I want you to bless your enemies. He said, yeah, with a brick. <laughs> bless them with a brick. How you treat people in kind. You, you get dissed, and so you diss them back. They defriend you, you defriend them back. How, how, you, how you treat them, how you respond, that's how you measure maturity. And so there's times, let's say this, there's times when I'm mature and there's times when I'm not. Maturity is not a level of life that you, you arrive at and then <clears throat> live there for the rest of your life. doesn't come with age, doesn't come with tenure, doesn't come with any kind of seniority. It's something that you can actually experience for a period of time and you can lose it. And so all of a sudden, mom and dad's not acting very mature. The pastor is not acting very mature. The leader is not acting very mature. If you just start at verse 48 as the goal and read backwards, you can measure your own maturity from time to time. Very, very helpful. So this is a powerful sermon. Uh, Jesus could have preached this anytime, anywhere. I could preach it anytime, anywhere, and it'll touch, it'll touch people where they live because almost everything that happens to us has to do with how people treat us and how we treat them. And that's what he's going after. So when he sat down and he delivered this, they had never heard anything like it. No rabbi had taught like this. Peter was there, and he caught this sermon. And what Peter does, it's, it's interesting. If you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, this is Peter's rendition of the same sermon. <clears throat> Peter caught it. He heard it, digested it. Walked it out, lived it out. He wasn't always mature. There's times Paul had to confront him. Others had to confront him. He wasn't always mature. But he gets into this, and, and he represents the same sermon that Jesus gave, only it's in his, his own words. But it's exactly the same sermon. So let's go there together. And let's, let's open up to chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. He starts off by saying, wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands. And he gets into, he's starting to talk about the family, marriages. Talks about what's important in verse 2 down to uh, verse 6 in terms of relationship. Because you're, you're, you're really no more spiritually mature than you are in your marriage at home. We can put a dipstick in your heart, pull it out. Measure your maturity by how you, how you relate to your husband, how you relate to your wife. Verse 7, nails me between the eyes so many different times. He starts speaking to husbands. Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. It's the weaker vessel and being heirs together in the grace of life. Treating your wife like a Christian. Sometimes we treat our wives in a way that no man would ever treat another Christian. But we treat her. We get so familiar and... and uh, so offended, we treat her wrong. And, and Peter's going after this. 
So he starts off talking about marriage. Now watch this, verse 8. He said, finally, all of you, he's writing to a large swath of the church. He's saying now he's moved into speaking to the church because everything that applies to the family applies to the church. Everything that applies to the church applies to the family. It's the same. All the same principles, all the same promises, all the same uh, goals, everything that God's, God's trying to mature our families, our marriages. He's trying to mature our church. There are immature churches and there are ch mature churches, uh, churches that are mature. Say that five times fast. How you relate, how you treat each other, not how long you worship, not how long you speak in tongues, not, not how, how much you dance before the Lord. That's not the measure of maturity. The measure of maturity is relationships, how you, how you treat each other. And some churches are not mature and some are, are more mature first season. So Peter gets into this thing. He's talking about family. In verse 8, he says, finally, all of you. So now we're moving to the church. All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. In other words, uh, you have this feeling because you understand what they're going through. You've stepped back long enough to say, well, what if I was going through that? How would I want to be treated? Compassion is your pain in my heart. So he says, get into compassion. Start... Rather than just write the person off, step back and say, well, then what are they going through? And you find that you can get in this place of compassion for them. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. This whole thing with tenderheartedness, uh, a silent killer for the spiritual life is a thing called hardheartedness. Hardheartedness, where you just, you used to love them, and now you've just steeled your heart, and you don't care about them. You don't care what they're going through. You've hardened your heart. It's an awful killer. It's a silent killer. This whole idea of being courteous, it's funny. When somebody does something that's offensive to you, to your sensibilities, or, or, or they're just not treating you properly, it's easy to set aside courteousness and just let them have it. He says, not turning, verse 9, not turning... Returning evil for evil, reviling for reviling. In other words, there's this reflex. They do something to you, so you do something right back to them. They treat you bad, evil, so you treat them bad. Husbands and wives do this all the time. Uh, she said this, and so I, it's a, it's a one-upmanship one where you end up, you do something right back to them. Kind of fix their wagon. Reviling is, is mostly verbal, where they, you say a bunch of bad things, they say a bunch of bad things back, and next thing you know, you got an Israeli-Palestinian conflict right in your living room where it's just spiraling down where you, you can't hardly recover it. It's tit for tat. She did this, and I, I did that. For someone to break that, that downward spiral, here's what Jesus taught that's so profound. There's this downward spiral. <clears throat> She rejects me and says this about me. And, and, and there's a thing where you have to kind of put a little spin on it. <clears throat> so he talks, about, uh, he talks about speaking honestly, not, not embellishing the thing. Because it's, you want to get a little spin on that, you end up, you, you exaggerate it. You make it sound a little worse than what it really was, or you add something to it that didn't really happen. And that just spins it out of control. So what Jesus teaches that's so profound, you got this happening in your home or in your church, and one person actually stops and stops doing that. That's, that's half the battle. But they actually do good. They go and they make a cup of tea. Right in the middle of a fight, they serve you a cup of tea. It's kind of hard to be mad at someone when they've just made you a cup of tea. And, and next thing you know, you do something else that's good. You come out and the dishes are all done. And you come out back out and, and, and something else has happened. Dinner's cooked. Not, not what you feel like doing. It's just the right thing to do. Someone's got to reverse this thing. And it's the most mature Christian in the room that does the reversing. Who, who, who is the one who backs this up? The most mature one is the one who backs it up. You can tell who's the most mature by what you do. 
He says, not returning evil for evil. There's this absolute natural reflex. It, it, it is your first response. It doesn't matter how old you are in the Lord. It doesn't matter how many spiritual experiences you have. Your first response is negative. Your first response is your flesh. Your first response is, uh, they just did this to me. Oh, I'll do that. Oh. And you start thinking what you could do back to them to zing them, to, to communicate to them what they did to you was wrong. It's a natural response. To be supernatural, to go beyond that, is to actually do good when someone does something evil to you. It doesn't even make sense. It's counterintuitive. It goes against the grain of your flesh. But it's what Jesus did. Jesus did this all the time. It's profound to watch him walk this out. He didn't just teach it. He did it. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that we're called to this. That we may inherit a blessing. Now, this is, this is very, very powerful. Rather than reviling for reviling, he says what you do is you go cross-thread that whole thing and you bless them. You do good to them. You, do, you bless them. Find a way to give them something. Find a way to encourage them. Find a way to break the pattern. Find a way to do that. That's, he says when you do that, we're called to this because we're called to be like Jesus. We're called to be like our Father. That's our calling. That's our number one calling. Our number one calling is a call to maturity, to be like our Father. Then he says this. He says, you inherit a blessing. So the incentive to go against the grain of how you feel is to say, you know, I, I want God's blessing. I crave God's blessing. I want it on my marriage, my life, my motives. I, I, I want God's blessing squarely on my life. I don't want to do anything that's going to take away from the blessing of the Lord. I crave God's blessing. It's the best thing. There's nothing better than the blessing of the Lord. And he says the way to inherit that, the way to, uh, to seize that or, or to gain that, remember it says that the meek shall inherit the earth. It's the same word. The way to gain a blessing is to give a blessing, especially when they haven't been very nice to you. Inherit a blessing. I, uh, do you remember when you're, I remember when I was a kid, we had a, a five and dime store on our main street. I love going in there, the squeaky old wooden board floors and the smell of the place and the candy display and the rows of toys. I mean, just, just to go in there was a, a treat for Saturday morning. But I, I love this great big old cash register. They would have a cash register. It was like a four foot square, this massive cash register with these big, keys and and i love the sound they would push those big keys you really had to pump them and you'd push those big keys and it would go cha-ching you'd hear it almost all throughout the whole store cha-ching well the lord showed me something he said when you do something good to something to someone who's done something bad to you there's a blessing in it and i and i thought well what if i what if i just said in my heart cha-ching cha-ching and so somebody would be snotty toward me, and I want to be snotty back, but I refrain. That's half the battle. But then to go the other way and actually do something good to someone who's been snotty to me, cha-ching, cha-ching, I just got a blessing. Somehow in the annals of heaven, somehow in the courts of heaven, God says, bless that boy. Bless him. And so I, now you don't do this out loud. And you don't do this to your wife if she knows the cha-ching story because it'll, it'll get bad real quick. It won't solve any arguments. But I, would, I, I found myself going through a time where it just seemed like at every turn people were treating me bad and, and I wanted to fix their wagon. I wanted to communicate how it felt. That's the, that's the thing. We want to let them know how it felt. So we end up doing the kind. And so when you refrain, that's one thing. But then they actually go the other way and do something good. Cha-ching, cha-ching. And I, start, I started racking up blessings. Cha-ching. Now watch this. Peter 
He's teaching Jesus. He's teaching, he's regurgitating the Sermon on the Mount. And then he quotes David. And David, the most amazing thing, when you go through the, about the first 50 Psalms, or David's Psalms, David's, he, here he is, he, uh, uh, he's, he's a God, God's favorite. I mean, he just really seems to be God's favorite. And yet there's all these people who don't like him. And they wish, him, they wish that he would die. And they wish that he got sick one time and they, they lined up to wish that he would die. And he writes about it. And he, he complains to the Lord about it. Here he is, this awesome king that we're talking about, you know, thousands of years later in Penyan because he's such a hero to us. But in his own day, he said, there's people who just trash me. They hate me, Lord. They lie about me. They wish that I was dead. I've done good to them and they've done bad to me. I mean, he's... The first 50 Psalms, there's a lot of that in there. So David's saying this. Now listen, verse 10. Let's go look at this. He says, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Deceit is when you add a little bit more to it to make it hurt a little bit more. Now David's, David's doing something powerful here. It's almost like a song. There's, you could write a song. Any, anyone who's a songwriter here know this is a good lyric. Listen, listen to this. For he who would love life and see good days. Now, you've just heard me sing for the first time in 10 years. You can make a song out of that. How many, how many would love to, your motto is, I love life and I'm seeing good days. How many want that? I, hi, hi, hey, how you doing? Well, I love life. And I'm seeing good days. How good is that? You, you could say it differently. I'm walking on the sunny side of the street. I'm, I'm blessed and full of favor. I mean, there's different ways you can say it. But this is a beautiful line that says, anyone who would love life and see good days, here's, what he do, here's, how, you, here's how you come into it. You refrain from doing what your flesh wants to do. You say no to that response you say no to that tit for tat so he says let him refrain his tongue his lips no more don't embellish it for let him turn away from evil and then do good now doing good it's kind of like uh, Jesus uh, or Paul said uh, love is love is uh, Patient and kind. It's one thing to be patient, but then to go the other way and actually be kind, that's, that's a whole different thing where you're actually good to someone. He's saying here, he's saying, watch this now, let him turn away from evil and do good. So if you want to love life and see good days, do good to those who aren't doing good to you. Let him seek peace. That's the mature one. Let him seek the peace. Let him pursue it. Now let's stop here for a second. This is a revelation. This is something that the Lord was teaching me when I was going through a hard time. So let me see if I can communicate this. Let me see if I can say this. Your happiness, your loving life, and seeing good days is not dependent or contingent upon what people do to you. It's only contingent on what you do back. In other words, people could trash you, defriend you, defame you. And you can still love life and see good days, not because of what they've done, but only because of what you've done. You can't control what they do. You can barely control what you do. But he says, you can love life and see good days. All you have to do is refrain and then go the other way. Next thing you know, you're on the sunny side of the street. Next thing you know, you're walking. You're, you say, I'm blessed and full of favor. I am a blessed man. I am a blessed man. Well, how, how come you're feeling that way? Don't you know what they're saying about you? Don't they know what they did? Don't you know what they posted? And you say, it doesn't matter what they do. All that really matters in order for me to love life and see good days is my response. Isn't that liberating? Because you can't control what they do. You can't make people like you. You can't make people stop speaking evil, reviling you, rejecting you. You can't stop that. You can't control that. 
And if you try to control it, you'll go crazy. What you can control is your own mouth. What you can control is your own flesh. What you can control is you can say, I'm going to refrain, and I'm not going to put a spin on that. I could make them look so bad so quickly. All I have to do is say this and maybe add a little spice to it. I'm going to refrain from that. In fact, I'm going to go the other way, and I'm going to do good to them who've treated me so nasty. Next thing you know, you feel so liberated. Next thing you know, you start feeling something. Now listen, something of what God feels on his, in his heart, you start feeling in your heart. Next thing you know, you feel blessed. Next thing you know, you feel like you're on top of things. Because you hate, you hate yourself when, you, when this whole thing slides out of control and, and you get that Israeli-Palestinian thing going on in the living room. You just hate, you hate your marriage, hate, hate life. You, hate, you don't sleep well. You don't eat well. You don't, if your marriage is, is suffering, nothing feels good. Nothing feels right. It, it really is the center of things. And if you're a dad and your kids are at odds with you, it's miserable. It doesn't matter whether you get a pay raise. It doesn't matter how they, how they treat you downtown. If your kids are at odds with you, you feel miserable. You can't control how they treat you. You can control how you respond. How you respond determines the blessing. How you respond determines whether you love life and see good days. Isn't that good news? It's liberating because it's all within your court. You can do something about it. And it surprises them when they get a, a card, a note from you, and it's got a, it's got a little card to Applebee's in it, and, and, and they know they don't deserve it. And they get a little iTunes card, and, you, and they say, well, what, well, what's this for? Well, I just wanted to bless you. I know you like, I know, here's a, here's a, here's a book on Amazon, a little gift card. And they say, well, I, you know, we're, we're, we're not getting along these days. And, I mean, it's a, it blows their mind. They, don't, they won't know how to respond. Well, who does this? The most mature one in the group. The most mature Christian. We can measure your maturity. You can measure your maturity. Let's keep reading for a minute. The reason we do this isn't to impress anybody else. It's not to impress the person who's hurt us. Who reviled us? Listen, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The word face here is the same word for presence. And there's, there's been times when the Lord's resisted me and withheld his presence from me because my response to people especially my, my own wife, was wrong. Next thing you know, I'm not feeling the presence of the Lord. Next thing you know, it feels like my prayers aren't leaving the room. In fact, I have no compelling uh, draw to pray. I had no desire to pray. No, Usually I feel like he's inviting me. There's this, a drawing. And so that's been lifted. And I, I, I'm no longer feeling the presence of the Lord. And when I get into that and I start seeking, I get hungry for that. I, I want that sense that he's listening, that sense of a nearness, that intimacy, and that's been ruined, that's, that's lost. He does that in my life many times to bring me to repentance. I probably wouldn't repent except it's interfered between something between me, he and I. Uh, I. I'll make it right. I'll do it right. I'll backtrack. I'll be the one, I'll be the one to apologize. Who, who apologizes? The most mature, the one who wants the blessing, the one who wants the presence, the one who wants that open community with Jesus, that communion. You do it for his eyes only. You do it because you know he's looking. You do it because you know he's listening. You do it because you know he knows. And in the end, it's all that matters is what he sees. All that matters is what he knows. I don't want to be resisted from the Lord. His resistance isn't because he's rejected me. His resistance isn't because I'm not a son. His resistance isn't because 
he's, uh, he's uh, angry with me. His resistance is, is because my nature and what I'm doing, my behavior, is the opposite of his. It's like, it's like taking two magnets and you, you start to pull them together. And when there, there's a, a place where they just come together, they just click. Resistance is when you turn those magnets around and you try to force them together, you can't. There's an, they're, they're in opposition to each other. And there's times I feel that with the Lord, and I probably, listen, this is the honest truth. I probably wouldn't repent nearly as much, except I don't like that feeling of being resisted by him. I want to be close to my dad. I want, I want, I want his intimacy. I want, it, I want that openness in prayer. And, and many times when I feel like I'm going through a time where I can't pray and I, I don't, I'm not feeling his drawing, I'm not feeling his presence, it's because my relationships with other people have been skewed. I'm not, I'm not acting like my dad. I'm not acting very fatherly. And he wants that to change. Now, that's my sermon right there. That's it. But look, go to verse 13. He says, who, who is he who will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? This gets into, this gets into society now, and it spills over into everyday life and business. But even if you should suffer righteous, uh, for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Now, that word blessed is everything that we've been reading in Matthew chapter 5, which says, blessed are those who are persecuted. It's the same word. So there's a, there's a, a blessedness that you, you come into a spiritual advantage. Then he quotes another verse. This is, and, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, no stress, but sanctify the Lord your God, the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks the reasons for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It says, if you have a good conscience, they may defame you as evildoers, verse 16. They may re revile your good conduct, but they'll be ashamed. They'll be ashamed because they say, boy, I thought he was this way. I was doing this. I was doing this. And look how they're treating me. And all of a sudden, they're ashamed. We want them to change. We want them to get the message that their behavior is wrong. It's not, getting, it's not jutting out your bottom lip and getting in their face and, 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 and trashing them to their face. It's actually doing good, and all of a sudden they say, you know, I haven't been treating this person very well, and they, got, they, 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 they took me to lunch. I told this to one gal one time. She was just, she'd been fired. She'd been trashed. She'd been lied about uh, in, a, in a Christian ministry, and she couldn't get over it. I said, take them for lunch. I don't want to, and it's been, it's been a long time. She just never got over it. I said, just take them for lunch. She says, how would that even sound? I said, call them up and say, you know, we were, we were close. We worked together for a long time. I just, uh, no agenda other than I just want to take you out for lunch. And it's on me. And she did it, and she got free. Broke the whole cycle, broke the whole thing that was going on in her head, the war that was going on in her head. She was liberated. 20 bucks. <laughs> you get to sleep again. There's something in this. Now, this isn't Penn's theory. This is Jesus' teaching. And Paul, or Peter caught it, walked it out. It got into him. He, he now owns the truth. He bought the truth. And now it's his. And it's coming out slightly different. But it's actually the same sermon that Jesus did on the mount. It's exactly the same sermon. And it's in the context of marriage. But then in in the context of church because it's that's the same thing it's really the same thing there's no difference family and church is the same how mature are you i can't tell you the number of times people have insisted that i treat them as mature christians and give them positions and give them responsibilities and give them advantages and Treat them as a peer and treat, but they 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 skew this. They mess they mess this up all the time, and then they cite what they cite is years. It's tenure. It's how long they've been there. How long they've been in church. How long 
but we can't give them anything because there's no maturity because of the way they speak and treat people in the church. And we can't give it to them. Why? They're not mature. How mature are you? By the way, this doesn't even happen these days. I'm so free to talk about this because there's no issues that I'm aware of. I'm not preaching to one thing that's happened recently. I'm just saying this is, I think what God's been speaking to me, I think it's what he's speaking to us. I think it's a continuation of our marriage seminar that we did yesterday. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's not when, it's not, it's not if, it's when. We will need to apply this as a church. We will need to apply this in our marriage. So who makes the first cup of tea? <clears throat> who apologizes first? The most mature. The person who wants to be mature. The, it's, they take the first move. They take the first steps. And there's a blessing in it for us. Cha-ching. Cha-ching. How many want to be blessed? There's a blessing in it. Blessed. Spiritual advantage. Spiritual advantageous. Now, on this little paper are five, uh, seven verses. And these seven verses starts off, blessed are those. There's seven verses in the Gospels, just the Gospels, not even getting into what Paul wrote. Seven verses on this little page, half a page, that say, blessed are those. And I'd like you to study this out. I'd like you to look them up. I'd like you to find them. I'd like you to meditate on them. I'd like you to write them on post-it notes or recipe cards and put them on the refrigerator. I'd like you to get seven of these other verses. They would be very easy for me to read. In fact, I even have time to. But I, I don't think you'll really get the nutrition out of it. But what if you got these for yourself and you dug them out where Jesus said, blessed are those, spiritually advantageous are those who do this, 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 or this, seven times. I, there may be more, but there's seven that are laying right on the surface of Scripture. Amen? Let's stand together. Kids are having a ball. We're, we're not in any rush. Uh, they're going to be coming over to the cafe here in a little bit, but we got time. Let's pray. If somebody has come to your mind during this sermon that has treated you badly, and you've dished it back out, you ladled it back out in kind, I want you to tell the Lord, I will make that right. I know you see. I know you hear. I can't deal with it this morning, but I tell you this. I will make that right. I want to be like you. I want to walk like you. I want to talk like you. I want to be like you, Father. I want to do what you've done so I could become what you're like. I want to be like you. Help me. If you've been feeling some resistance from the Lord, his presence isn't there. Other people all around you are bowing and raising their hands and definitely experiencing something, but you've lost sight of that for some reason, why don't you say, Lord, whatever it is, put your finger on it. Whatever it is, show it to me. I want that made right. I crave your nearness. I crave your presence. I will make that right. Show me, and I'll do it. Tell me, and it's over. I will, I'll clean that up. I'll mop that up. I'll make that right. Father, thank you for your word. Jesus, what a sermon that you gave in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Help us to own it. Help us to get it into our, our lives. Make it real for us. Where the rubber hits the road. In Jesus' name, amen.
I got about 20 minutes before the kids come over, so why don't you hang out?